Father in heaven, we just thank you that you are the way maker. That when you make a promise unlike us, you keep it. And you have the power and the willingness and the ability to do so. Father, we are so thankful that, that you have made a way for us to know you, to know about you. Not just to know you and know that you're a holy God and live in fear of the day that we should meet you, but that you've made a way for us to deal with the sin that all of us have as a part of our life and our story, to be forgiven of the wrong that we have done, to be filled with your spirit, to rise and to walk from the waters of baptism as new people made alive again through your power. Father, I, I know that sometimes we forget that this life that we call Christianity, that the early Christians called the way, is, is such a blessing, such a gift, and we just take it for granted. And Father, please forgive us. Sometimes, Father, I know that we discount your goodness and your mercy and your grace. And we take all the good things that you have given us, the life that you've provided, and we, we destroy it. And we're left with a pile of ruins and a broken heart and a task that seems overwhelming for us to dig through and to restore. Father, I just thank you that in the midst of that moment, you come and you stand by our side and you help us turn tragedy into celebration and brokenness into new purpose. I pray, Lord, this morning that you might open our hearts, each one, to understand how it is that you want to do that in our lives today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week, we started a series that we call RE, and it's going to each week be a different thing that starts with those first two letters. Last week, we took a look at what it means to be renewed and how the whole really theme of Scripture is this idea of restoration and renewal and taking something that has been, that has been broken and, and, and making it beautiful again. And this morning, we're going to build on that theme, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to rebuild. Because no matter who we are this morning, I think probably most of us understand what it means to have to rebuild something. And it's certainly not as exciting as building it the first time. In fact, I think that maybe people who live in southern Louisiana have a deeper appreciation for the word rebuild than most people do. Because on occasion, a large storm builds up in the Gulf and it rolls through our part of the country and we, maybe if you're, if you're one of those people that, that leaves for a storm, you leave and the house is like it's always been, the neighborhood is like it's always been, and then you return to an unknown reality. Tree limbs are down, broken power lines, food spoiling in the refrigerator, sometimes roofs are knocked off or tree limbs are through roofs. What was once a sanctuary and a safe place has become an absolute mess that must be rebuilt. And what do we do in those moments, whether they're physical moments of rebuilding or whether they're spiritual moments of rebuilding, whether we're seeking to rebuild our finances or rebuild a relationship, what do we do to be successful in that moment? Because a lot of people get to that place. In fact, I, I'm lit, talking to a couple of friends that are working in, and are involved in a lot of things over in, Texas, in uh, Lake Charles as well as in, as in Homa. And they said that you would not believe the number of neighborhoods where houses are just being torn down. Because the people came back to the place that they had invested all this money in where they raised their children, and now it's an absolute destroyed mess. And that situation was so overwhelming in the moment that they could do nothing but just walk away from it and abandon it and allow the natural processes of nature to destroy what remained. And yet, in that same block, maybe right next to that house, there'll be a house that maybe, maybe suffered a far greater extent of, of damage and yet has been restored to even better than what it was previous to the storm. How do we take the challenges that life throws at us and rebuild those into a thing that brings glory and honor to God. This morning, we're going to take a look at that and ask that question. The background to how we got where we are this morning is really kind of simple and yet a little bit complicated at the same time. Israel, the nation of Israel, really was at its zenith of power and might during the reigns of David and his son Solomon. And archaeologists have long kind of... Kind of uh, diminished the role of Israel in the Near East, but as more digs happen and as more information is collected, we're realizing that Israel was a power player in the Near East in that period of time. 
People from all around the world, just as the Bible said, came to, to the city of Jerusalem to see the spectacular temple that Solomon had built, to listen and learn from the wisdom that they received from Solomon, to see the world around, uh, around Jerusalem, how magnificent it was. And it was a powerful, influential, wonderful city. But on the death of Solomon, the nation of Israel went through a painful civil war, and the once powerful and prosperous nation was torn into two sections. The northern section the ten tribes we call Israel. And immediately their leaders decided it would not be appropriate for them to return to the center of worship in Jerusalem, which was the remaining two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And so their leaders erected for them high places, places of worship, one in the north at Dan and one in the south at Beersheba, in which they erected golden calves, which might sound familiar to us. And they told their people, don't go to Jerusalem and worship, go to one of these high places instead. And so and we know that not everyone was obedient in that moment, but many people did, and soon the northern ten tribes became quite idolatrous. When the Assyrians made their trip out of Mesopotamia around the northern part of the Arabian desert and then came down into the land of Palestine, they easily overcame the nation of Israel. They dispersed those inhabitants and they went into captivity. But last week we looked at the story of what happened when they came to the city of Jerusalem. Really, before they came to the city of Jerusalem. And how one godly king, Hezekiah, purposed in his heart that he was going to turn his people back to the Lord and seek God's protection. And we know the story. They, they, they did that. There was a great revival. They cleaned out the filth of the temple that took them over a week. And, and they reinstituted worship of the one true God, discarding the fake gods that had been a, a plague of their existence as well. And then they made preparations for a siege. They dug a tunnel underneath the city from the, from the, uh, from the stream out, or the spring outside the city into the city. And the nation of Assyria encircled the city of Jerusalem. And in given time, they gave up and they returned, never to return again. But time passes. Good kings die. They were replaced by kings that wanted to fit in with the cultures and tribes around them. And again, idolatry is rampant. And God sends the prophet Jeremiah to tell his people, hey, if you guys don't straighten up, I'm going to bring another nation against you. But they chose not to. In fact, they chose to, they chose to alienate the prophet. They, they sent him to Egypt in exile. And when he would return, they threw him finally in the bottom of a well, hoping that they would silence his voice. But just as God had said, 136 years later or so, Nebuchadnezzar came in 587 B.C. with a powerful army that easily overwhelmed the defenses of Jerusalem. He destroyed the city. He looted and smashed the beautiful temple that was built there. And he took the inhabitants, the best and the brightest of the nation of Israel, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and he carries them off to his capital city, which is Babylon. From that period of time, we get those great stories from the book of Daniel. And, and we know that God, although they weren't in their homeland, God was still working among them, and he was sending a powerful message to the nations of the world. But just as Jeremiah had said, in the course of time, God would send his people back to their homeland. Seventy years they would live in exile, and at the end of 70 years, God raised up another nation. Not the Assyrians, not the Babylonians, not the Medio Persians, but the Persian Empire, that they would kind of, kind of dissolve the, the relationship with the Medio Persians. A new king would come to the throne, and just in the nick of time, God's people would return home. And God provided two leaders who each one have a book in the Old Testament, maybe not familiar to many of us outside of their name, Ezra and Nehemiah. And both of these men were used by God as powerful tools to encourage and challenge his people to accomplish a rebuilding project that looked to be absolutely undoable. Ezra was a, was a kind of preacher and the spiritual leader. Nehemiah was the motivator of men. And together with other people who gathered around them, they made a difference that would last for generations. And so from their story this morning, we're going to learn some of the key elements of what we need in order to rebuild in the world in which we live in today. If you have your Bibles, grab those. Turn with me to the book of Ezra. Ezra, 
uh, the first chapter and pick up in verse number one. Luckily for us this week, there's only one Ezra, um, so I won't be uh, in, in, first, uh, in first Ezra. I'm supposed to be in second. Ezra, the first chapter, verse number one, and we're going to begin um, this tale as Ezra begins the story um, at the very beginning, which is a very good place to start. It said, in the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, uh, or that the word of the Lord brought by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom and also put it in writing. And this is what he said. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build his house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judea, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And then Ezra goes on to tell us all the things that they were sent with. And you, you look at this list right here, and they send all the gold and the silver and the beasts and all that stuff. But then, as, then King Cyrus opens up the treasure house of King Nebuchadnezzar, which, of course, his predecessor, the, the, uh, Darius, the king of the Medio persian Empire, had taken from uh, Belshazzar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And there's a lot of awesome stuff in there. You can read through the list. Tons of gold, bowls, and utensils, hundreds of things made of silver, and all of the precious items that Solomon had had commissioned for the original temple. Nebuchadnezzar had held on to those, undoubtedly because they were so beautiful. And he gathers together this huge bunch of loot, and he sends all of this back along with all the other things that people had sent with uh, those people, and they begin an epic journey back to the land of their nativity. This morning, I think from this story, we can gain four really important lessons. And the first one maybe is one of them that I am the most passionate about. You may disagree with me, and I understand that, and that's fine. But I, I think that the Bible teaches us something that is very reassuring and should really shape how we look at current events in our world today. And that is simply this. If we are going to rebuild if we are going to rebuild our civilization, if we are going to rebuild our families, if we're going to rebuild the morals in our communities and our churches, I think the first thing we have to recognize is this, that God is the one in control. Not us, not the politicians in Washington, not the people who usurp or, or act like they're in control, but simply God is in control. If you look at the opening text here in this passage, it reminds us of exactly how much God was in control. It says, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord, by the mouth of Jeremiah, as we've pointed out, might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of, the, of Cyrus, the king of Persia. He didn't just come up with this idea on his own. History tells us that something very interesting happened because as Cyrus approached the throne, he was convinced that the best way to manage all the desperate peoples that had been collected by Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon and the best way for him to administer his empire, which was vast, was not to do so with military might, but with economic, with economic uh, puppet strings. And so his idea was, is that he was going to take all these people who had been for a long time away from their home countries, and he was going to send the Israelites back to Israel and, and, and other nations back to their homelands. And by doing so, he would put administrators and people there that were present, they would make better use of the property, they would make it more economic, economically prosperous, he would tax them, and he would increase his empire, not just militarily, because he ran the world, but he wanted to increase his empire economically. But Ezra tells us that there was a very important reason why Cyrus had this idea, and that is that the Lord stirred up his spirit so that he made a proclamation. And the proclamation is pretty powerful because <laughs> he said, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me the kingdoms of the earth. Cyrus admitted the fact that he was in the place where he was, not because he had a big army or that he had the right bloodlines or that he was just lucky, but because God had put him there. 
Sometimes we look around at the leaders in the world that have been appointed over us. And I know we live in a place that is a democracy, and so in a sense we vote for the leaders that will lead our nation. And we think to ourselves, surely God didn't put those leaders in that place. But Cyrus is the end of a set of leaders that God has put into place. And the first of those leaders, a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, was an absolute tyrant. He was a man bent on world domination by any means possible. He was a man that would take young people from their homes and enslave them without asking. He was a man that loved to tear up people's houses, bury them underneath their own properties, and then turn their properties into a manure collection place. This man was evil in many, many ways. Now, God worked powerfully in the life of Nebuchadnezzar, and I believe by the end of his life, he was a changed man from the beginning, but God was using some pretty dark people. Belshazzar was an absolute party animal. Darius, the king of the Medes and Persians, history tells us that he wasn't the kind of guy you would want to go eat dinner with either. God was working in each of these guys' lives, whether or not they wanted to admit it. Cyrus, wisely, chose to admit that God had sent him. But then you notice how God works in the life of Cyrus because not only does God, Cyrus agree to let God's people go, maybe a part of the story that we don't realize is that he sent them with enormous amounts of wealth, with absolutely staggering amounts of stuff. And then he challenged other people to do the same. When God works, he works in ways far bigger than we can ever imagine. The Persian Empire will be conquered by a young man by the name of Alexander, who represents a nation called the Greeks. The Greeks would take over the entire known world from the Persians, and, and when they did so, they demanded that every person in the world speak the Greek language. All of a sudden, the entire world has a native tongue, but they also have a tongue of commerce. Every person that's educated throughout the world could understand and talk with one another. And soon the Greek nation was overtaken by the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire went throughout the world building roads and superhighways. And not only building those roads, but keeping those roads safe so that people began to travel from place to place freely, like what we enjoy in the United States today. And as they went, the disciples and apostles of Jesus Christ went with them, preaching the tongue of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a single language. God was working from the very beginning to the very end so that the gospel message might be proclaimed to the farthest corners of Europe by missionaries carried there benevolently, well, maybe not so benevolently, under persecution by the Roman authorities. God is working. And I think it's a high time that as the American church, we admit that God is in control. And the leaders that have been placed over us are possibly the leaders that God is putting there for a reason. That doesn't mean you have to like them. <laughs> In fact, the, the Jewish people called, the, called uh, Nebuchadnezzar the destroyer of nations. That's what they called him. That was their name for him, and it was a very apt name. He was proud of it, apparently. It doesn't mean that they have to be good people, but it means that sometimes God uses those leaders to shape the spiritual lives of his people. Even someone as awful as Adolf Hitler, who pursued terrible atrocities in, our, in the generation past during the Second World War. After that war was ended, there was such a significant amount of sympathy for the Jewish people and the plight that they faced under his hand that everyone agreed that there should be a homeland, a native land of the Jewish people, and the nation of Israel was created fulfilling the prophecies that Jesus said, that the season of the Gentiles, the trampling down of the Gentiles, would someday come to an end. God isn't just once working. God is still working in the world. Now, you might say, well, Jason, why are you so passionate about this? This is why I'm so passionate about it. Because if God has put the government in place today, if God has put the leaders that are in charge in the places where they are today, he's not doing that emptily. There's a reason. There's a purpose. There's a plan. And if God has a purpose and plan, then that means 
that I, as his child, need to see that purpose and plan and then do my best to pursue the direction that God is going, right? I, it's my opportunity to celebrate what God is doing in the world, even if sometimes it's not so good for me personally. Could it be that God is trying to demonstrate to us as his people that we have lost and walk, walked far away from the roots of our nation and the principles that established us? God is in control. And I think the story of the Israelite people is one that preaches that more powerfully than any sermon that I could preach. But Ezra and Nehemiah also learn something else. This group of people that come with them from the land of captivity back to the city of Jerusalem by, by absolute necessity had to learn something else. And that was in order to rebuild, they had to learn how to lean, how to lean on God. Each of these people that would take this trip would spend an enormous amount of time. Today, you could hop in a plane, and I think around four, four hours or so, you could make it from Babylon, which is in our modern-day Iraq, back to the city of Jerusalem, which is in southern Israel. Quick plane drop over, over the desert. But in those days, it took them four months. Four months of road travel, four months of sleeping out in tents, four months of being concerned about, about all this massive loot that they are bringing from Babylon to take back to rebuild the house of the Lord and, and from bandits and from unsecure situations. In fact, Ezra talks a little bit about this in Ezra 8, and, and he's very, very concerned about this as they head out. And he knows that they have a contingent of soldiers that have been sent with them, horsemen, but he's reluctant to ask them for assistance. And I love the reason why. He said, I was reluctant to ask them because I had told them that the Lord would be with us. Ezra knew the moment that he walked out of the security of, of Babylon that if God wasn't in this, it wasn't going to happen. And so, and so as he heads out, he stops all the people on the beginning of this trip, and they go through a season of fasting and prayer, praying for God's safety. And as you would expect, the people made it safely back to Jerusalem against really all odds, completely intact and with all the things that they had, been, that they had set out on the trip with. You know, leaning moments come as a variety of things in our world today. Sometimes we're forced to learn to lean when it's a health crisis or maybe a loved one is struggling with something, whether it be physical or mental or, or, or spiritual. Sometimes we have to learn to lean because of family drama or relationships that have broken. Sometimes we have to learn to lean because someone who has always been a part of our life is taken from us and their eyes have closed in death. And all of a sudden, maybe that person that we once depended on, that we once leaned on, is no longer there for us to. Maybe, maybe this morning you're one of those rare people that don't know the experience of what it means to need to lean on somebody. And, and if you're that person, if you're sitting here thinking, Jason, I don't know if I know what you're talking about, probably that day is coming. Seems like sooner or later all of us go through hard times. Somehow, some way, it's just a part of life. There's seasons that are wonderful and there's seasons that are difficult. There's seasons where we're confident and seasons where we are insecure. And it's in both of those seasons that God wants to be right by our side. He wants us to be leaning on him. And the, when the lean time come, Jesus told us you better have a secure foundation. He told that famous parable of two men each one who built their house that they could weather the storms of life in. The first man chose to build his house on the sand and the rain came and the wind rose and it hit against the house and the house blew apart. But the second man chose to build his house on a firm foundation, on the rock. And the Bible says that when the wind blew and the storm came, the house on the rock stood firm because it was built on a firm foundation. Ezra and Nehemiah were successful First of all, because they recognized that God was in control. Ezra writes that right into the opening words of his book, that it was the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord, that stirred Cyrus to do what he did. It was God who is shaping all of the history that led up to this point. And by nature, they had learned what it was like to lean. These people were leaving safety and security of Babylon, and they were going to a very uncertain future. They had no idea what they were going for, except that they had been called by God to do it. And they were willing to answer that call. 
The third thing that we can learn from this story is that if we want to be people that are built, rebuilding with the Lord, sometimes we have to celebrate through the tears. You might say, well, Jason, what are you, what are you talking about there? Celebrate through the tears. Are we crying or are we cheering right here? And sometimes the answer to that question is yes. Read with me in, 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 in Ezra, the third chapter. Ezra relates this very interesting time that happened. And you mentioned, I mentioned earlier that there were other people that were a part of these stories. One of them was a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel had made it to Jerusalem a little bit before Ezra, and the main contingent of the people came from Babylon. And so as soon as Zerubbabel gets to the to uh, Jerusalem, they immediately seek out among the ashes and ruins where the original temple stood, and they, they cleared the temple mount, they quarry new stones, they clean up old stones, and they lay a foundation for the new temple. And then comes the story that we read here in Ezra, the third chapter, because in verse number 12, it says, but many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice. Now, maybe some of us who are younger here today are wondering, why are these guys crying? I mean, they, they've been in captivity for 70 years. They finally get to come back. These young guys, led by this, this guy named Zerubbabel, have already started the project. They walk up to look at the project. <laughs> but I bet most of you older people know exactly why they cried. I grew up in a different era than some of you guys. I know a lot of you who are younger think that I'm pretty old, and I am, and some of you who are older think I'm kind of young, and probably I am compared to you. I, I kind of grew up on the end of an era. When I, when I was a kid, they had these things called rallies. I know some of you who are younger are like a rally. What, what in the world is a rally? Um, and uh, the one that was most, fam or most familiar to me was one that was held in a little town in southern Iowa called Centerville. And so it was named the Centerville Rally. Very original name right there. But it was very descriptive. Everyone knew exactly what that was. Somebody in times past, a simple guy by the name of Dewey Locke, had a vision for a campground. So he bought a piece of land on the Sheraton River, and he built a machine shed. It's just an old barn out there, right? And, 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 and every year, right before school started, hundreds of people from all over the United States would drive from all corners of the United States, and they would gather in this building, and it would be so packed in this building that when we would get there, and a lot of times we got there late because my dad got off work late, um, by the time we would drive the 45 minutes to an hour down to this, this rally, right, the singing was ending, and there wasn't a seat left in this building. This building was bigger than this building, and there wasn't a seat left in the building. Everyone was packed. Sometimes, if, my, if I was lucky, my grandma saved me a seat, but more than once, I would look in, find grandma, and she would go like this. That meant there were no seats to go sit by my grandparents. It was absolutely packed. And so, myself and a whole bunch of other families are sitting outside of this building, listening to a guy on the inside of the building preach the message of the gospel. A few years ago, I was invited to go back and preach there. And when I was a little kid, I thought, well, it'd be cool to be that guy up front, you know? And then I was that guy. And I'm preaching on a Wednesday night to an audience that's smaller than this one this morning. The world has changed. And for those of us who knew something of a different era, that change is difficult. And I want you to know this morning that if you come from one of those past eras... It's okay for you once in a while to feel a little sorrow and a little sadness because the church was on fire at other times and other seasons and sometimes we don't see that same fire today. But we'd be amiss if we didn't continue to read in this text. Those who had seen the first house, they wept with a loud voice because they knew, <laughs> they knew how spectacular it had been built by Solomon with the finest craftsmen throughout the world, imported woods from Lebanon in the north. Every single inch of the inside was either covered with gold, with silver, or with precious fabric. The outside of the building was impressive, seen for miles around. It was built by Solomon to send a powerful message to the world, and that is our God is the greatest God around. People came to just marvel at it. And now these old men have returned to see the destruction of that former way. In a few measly foundation stones built at 
or lain in the place of the massive, enormous ones of a generation past. They wept when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, but many shouted for joy so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the shout of the people who were weeping for the people shouted such a great shout and the sound of it was heard far away. If you were somebody out in the fields around, around Jerusalem that day, you couldn't tell what kind of noise was happening in there because half of the people were going, oh, it's never going to be as beautiful as it once was. And the other half of the people said, we're rebuilding the, city, the temple of God. We are moving forward in the future. And it was just this ruckus of praise that went up to the Lord. Yeah, I'm sure that that first temple was impressive. But those new foundation stones... They heard the voice of the creator of the universe speak in their, in, under their columns. They saw the, 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 the promised Messiah come to the temple as a little baby. They would see the first converts of the church, thousands of people being baptized in the mitzvahs around those new foundation stones. Certainly things had changed. And yes, it wasn't as awesome as maybe the first temple was, but there was as many reasons to cheer as there were to cry. And I love the fact that Ezra doesn't stop anybody from doing either one. They just raise their voice as a unified praise, as a great shout to the power of God. You know, I think that most of the message of Ezra and Nehemiah, both books, comes with pain. In fact, it was all immersed in pain. It was hard work. It was disappointment. It was discouragement. It was dealing with negative people. And it was exhausting. I just want to challenge you this morning that when you look back, and sometimes we're tempted to get a little pensive, don't get stuck in weeping and miss out on the rebuilding. Because God is still working. God was doing a greater thing than Solomon's temple. It just didn't look like it yet. And that brings us to the fourth and final thing that I think is important for us to look at if we want to be people who rebuild with God. First of all, we've got to determine that God is in control and allow that to be the thing that we follow. Secondly, we've got to be willing to, to, uh, to, to see those things through to recognize that sometimes we're going to have tears and we're going to have celebrations that are just mixed together and we're going to have to look at the future through our eyes filled with tears and cheer for what God is about to do. And fourthly, we have to acknowledge sin. It's a part of our story last week and it's a part of our story this week because it just fits so importantly into all these texts in, this, in the middle of this, of this time, both Jerubbabel and Ezra are going to do something very similar. In the laying the foundation stones of the temples, Zerubbabel is going to lead in it. And as people begin to gather here and start this new life in Jerusalem, Ezra is going to lead this. Both of these men are going to build altars and they're going to offer sacrifices because they recognize that much of the reason why they're standing in the ruins that they're standing in that day is because of the sins of some of the people that were there and the generation before them. They were willing to acknowledge their sin. You notice what it says here in Ezra, the eighth chapter. It says, at that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel. And it's pretty substantial. Twelve bulls for all of Israel, although there's only two tribes left. Ninety-six rams, 77 lambs and a sin offering of 12 male goats. Again, for all of Israel, although there's just the two tribes left, they're making a very powerful statement here. They're saying, we collectively as a people, Lord, have failed you. All of this was a burnt offering to the Lord. If you weren't here last week, I explained a little bit more in detail, and we're not going to take time for that this morning. 
each of these offerings, the, the burnt offering, the, 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 the offering, the burnt offering, and the thanksgiving offering, and what the significance was of each of those. You can go back and either look at the notes on, on the website, or you can look at the video there and, and, and get that figured out. But this was, a, this was an intentional time where the leader of the people, Zerubbabel in the rebuilding of the temple foundations, and Ezra as the spiritual leader of the people, are stopping people, are pulling people back, and they're saying, hey guys, it's time that we acknowledge we have not been the people that God has called us to be. And you know, I think maybe it's appropriate. If we as the church want the world around us to acknowledge the sin that it's dealing with, that we first stop and acknowledge the sin within the church. That we haven't always been the people that we need to be. And certainly a lot of those people that were there that day, they weren't the people who had done idol worship. In fact, Israel was cured of idol worship after this 70-year exile into captivity. But they were, they were acknowledging the fact that, that we've dropped the ball as a people, as 12 tribes of Israel. We have failed the one true God who invested so much in us. You know, I know sin is not a popular subject to talk about. It's not comfortable for us to do so. It's often that kind of quiet elephant in the room. We know it's there. It shapes so much of what we do, how we look at ourselves, how we look at other people, but we never really stop to address it. When we make sin not important in our assemblies and in our own lives, I think unintentionally we are saying some things that are very troubling because sin is why the cross is absolutely essential. Sin is the thing that shows us most powerfully the goodness, the mercy, and the grace of God. Sin is the reason why Jesus came and died on a cross. In fact, when we minimize sin... We minimize the power of the cross. We minimize the grace and the goodness of God. We minimize the death of Jesus. And we minimize the beauty of the church. I think sometimes today, guys, one of the reasons why we're just kind of uh, laissez-faire about the church and about the mission of the gospel and about what God's calling us to do is that we are not real honest about our own sin. We kind of are casual about that as well. And I love how Ezra and Zerubbabel And no doubt, Nehemiah was a part of this as well. Before the project started, they stepped forward and they said, let's just be honest about something. We know why we're here. We're here because we turned our back on God. We're here because we chose our own path. We're here because we thought we knew better. And we were wrong. God, please forgive us. That's a statement that all of us need to make. In fact, 1 John, the second, the first chapter is a powerful passage. It's a very comforting passage to me. Picking up in verse number eight, it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John here is presenting us with two options. He's saying, if you minimize your sin, if you act like you don't have any sin, you're a liar. <laughs> In case you, he didn't, he didn't punt, pull the punch right there. That's who you are. But he said, if you confess your sins, God is, and this is the encouraging part for me, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even though we don't deserve it and even though it shouldn't happen and even though we shouldn't be able to go back to God over and over again and say, God, I messed up again. God, I gave in again. God, I'm weak again. God said, I'll forgive you. I just want you to acknowledge it. I want you to acknowledge the enormous price that was paid so that you're free. Church, maybe there's some of us that are here today that need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge the enormous price that was paid so that we might be free. If you don't know the story, I've got to close it for you. I haven't really even looked at all in the book of Nehemiah, who who tells a parallel account with Ezra. Ezra talks about the spiritual things and some of the surrounding political things that happened at this moment. Nehemiah talks about specifically rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. And together, these two men, along with many, many others, 
reconstruct the city of Jerusalem. And if you've never read the story of Nehemiah, grab your Bible this week and on your way to work or something, just have the app play it for you if you have it set up like that. Um, It's a great story. It's a narrative and it's fun to listen to. But I, I want us just to skip ahead to Nehemiah, the sixth chapter right here. In verse number 15, it says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul. In 52 days. And when our enemies all heard it, all the nations around us were afraid and they fell greatly in their own esteem. This is important because as you read through the story, you're going to find out that every corner, every moment, every time that they did something positive moving forward, all the people around said, it'll never work. It's going to fall apart. If a fox walks on it, it'll follow. You got, do you guys actually think that you know how to build a wall? You know what, guys? There's always somebody in the world that's going to be a naysayer. There's always a negative Nelly. There's always that person that says, you can't do what God says you can do. And you can choose to listen to those people because a lot of people do. These people didn't. In fact, <laughs> they did quite the opposite. They worked with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. They stopped up the gaps where they were. They continued to work both night and day. And in 52 days, they finished the wall. And then you notice all of a sudden a true, real problem was revealed. These people around them didn't think that it couldn't be done. They were afraid that it would be done. Guys, I think a lot of people in our world today aren't afraid that God isn't real. I think they're afraid that God is real. And our job is to live our lives in such a way that his power, that his presence, and that his might is revealed in how we live. That's exactly what happens right here. Notice how Nehemiah finishes this. He said they fell greatly in their own esteem. In other words, they weren't near as confident, near as cocky as they had been before that wall was constructed and those gates were set in place. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Church, we have a big rebuilding project ahead of us. There's a church that needs to be rebuilt. Some of you who are younger, maybe new to the church, you might not recognize that. But there was a passion, there was a fire, there was a determination that existed within the church in the United States in the 1950s and the early 1960s that simply does not exist today. We've tried to create programs and methods. We've tried to create illusions of of success. and, And we've pooled lots of people together and we can make it look impressive. But the problem is that the thing that the church was created for, which was life change, just isn't happening. People are coming to church, but they're not living different lives. And the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not revealed in the numbers of people sitting in a building, but in the kind of life that the people who are sitting in that building exhibit. We have a huge rebuilding project because the world around us has begun to kind of fall off because the church has fallen off. Yeah, we have a huge job, but we have a God who wants to be by our side. There's really four things that we need to do to make sure he's there. Number one, we've got to acknowledge it's not our ideas, our plans, our dreams. He's in control. Secondly, we've got to be willing to to put aside our own agenda and accept his agenda, plan, and purpose. Thirdly, we've got to be willing to work through change even if it's uncomfortable, even if it causes us to weep. We celebrate through our tears. And fourthly, we deal with our sin. You know, our Heavenly Father doesn't want to be on the other side of the building helping us. He wants to be right by our side. Maybe you have a huge rebuilding project in your life right now. Finances are out of control. Relationships are broken. Maybe your relationship with God is broken. As you look around, you just see rubble and debris, ashes and smoke. The creator of the universe, the one who formed the cosmos with his word, wants to help you rebuild it. There's no greater builder than our Heavenly Father. It kind of reminds me of the story of a man who had a little shop, sold a few clothes there, and one day a big retailer came in town and they bought every other building all around him. 
And they came to him and they said, you need to sell us your shop. He said, I'm not going to sell you my shop. They said, if you don't sell us your shop, we are going to put you out of business. This is what we're going to do. We're going to put shops in all up and down your right side of your store. And we're going to put shops in all up and down the left side of your store. And we are going to bury you with the competition. You might think that man would just give up and quit. Say, you know what, it's useless. I can't beat the big guy. They're bullying me into submission. But he did something very different. He said, that's fine. You guys go ahead and do that. And they did. They built shops all on the right and all on the left. And then the day of grand opening happened. And boy, they unfurled these huge banners across each of the, of the shopping centers on either side of this man's little store. Grand opening today. Grand opening today. And as the sun began to rise on their grand open banners. The little man walked out and hung a banner across his little store. And it said simply, main entrance here. Jesus said, narrow is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. And few there are that find it. You know, the thing is, it, is that what we forget is, even though the gate's narrow, it opens up into the most extraordinary of lives. I mean, look at Ezra, look at Nehemiah, look at Zerubbabel. These are men whose names we are talking about generations later. We still respect them and we honor them. We say these are some of the greatest builders and the greatest spiritual leaders ever simply because they were willing to lay everything else aside and pass through the path that God had chosen for them. It's narrow because you're going to have to leave a lot of other things behind. Jesus said, why does a gate why does a path that leads to eternal or to, to death? And many are find that. The thing about that path is it starts out wide, kind of like a 30-lane interstate, but then it bottlenecks down into a one-lane interstate, heading to a place that absolutely no one wants to go. God has given each of us this morning the opportunity to build, to rebuild with Him at our side, with His blueprints, with His vision, with His plan for the future. We would be the absolute most foolish people if we didn't take up his extraordinary offer of grace. Maybe you have a need this morning to have your sins washed away in baptism. Maybe, maybe some of us have done that years ago, but you realize I've got something that's keeping God over here and I want him to be by my side. Maybe some of us just realize, you know what, we've just sat here in the middle of the rubble and we've waited for someone else to do something and it's my job. God's calling me to be that person that goes into the middle of that and says, let's start cleaning up. Let's start laying a new foundation. Let's move forward. If God has something to work in your life today, I just pray that as we stand together, you might just bow your head and you might work that out with the Lord. If you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, we can have this baptistry filled in a few minutes. Those sins can be washed away. You'll be filled with His Spirit. And you'll be working together with the one who made it all to rebuild your life, your family, your community, and your world. Let's stand together, church. If you have a need, please come as we sing.